This is absolutely huge. Just when we thought Mick was done, Marty O'Donnell comes in and lets us know how he feels about the Mick situation, if it's right or wrong, and what he's going to do to possibly help. So we take a look here. This is Gibbs on the right. He interviewed Marty. Now, Gibbs has over 40 years of experience as a composer, had his musical national productions. It's so much good stuff. So a lot of knowledge between these two guys here. And thank you, Gibbs, for letting me be able to talk about this video here. So we're taking a look at what Marty says, and we're going to break it down a little bit and see, and see what Gibbs has to say, too seems to right now be taking a lot of the um, exposure of what's happening here. Are you a little familiar with, with what's been going on in that conversation? Yeah, I'm... I'm uh... So Marty is familiar because he tweeted out to Mick Gordon basically saying, you know, hey, I'm going to help you out with this. Let's talk about this. Let's see what's going on here. So let's see what Marty has to say. Uh, I would say very familiar. Um, yes, he is. Um, this I've, is cool. I've Listen. reached out to Mick. Um, he and I are in contact. I'm in contact with some other people. I'm in contact... I, I know a lot of people in, uh, who are composers in the game industry. So what that tells me is that he reached out to Mick. They made contact. Marty has talked to people, and he knows a lot of connections. And this is important for later on, the distinction that Marty makes. So check it out. And and here's how this goes. You know, we started out in the game Option. industry as contractors. This is Mick. So we would be hired by, in this particular case, Bungie. Now, think back, if you watch my original video on this topic, I had made a heavy, heavy distinction about contracts and how important they are. Mick got screwed over once for not putting things in contract, and I talked about my friend who works contracts. They are extremely important, and Marty's got some things to say. And we would contract to, to do music and audio. Um, then I became an, an in-house guy, and I became the audio director who worked for Bungie. Then we all got bought by Microsoft, and now I'm a Microsoft employee doing Ooh. Halo 1, 2, 3, um, ODST and Reach. See, that, that stands out to me a lot, too. And, of course, I'm going to put this whole interview. It's over two hours in the description below. He eventually became a Microsoft employee, which id Software, Bethesda, Zenimax, Microsoft, a little bit different. But the difference between Mick and Marty is that Mick has mostly seen things from the contract side, rather than Marty has been on the books, a full-time employee, and he goes into more detail here. And that's a very important distinction to make because the way that a contractor is treated as opposed to the way an in-house employee is treated, think of the term tribalism. They treat their best in the best way, and if you're outside of that, you get the shaft a little bit. So let's see what both Gibbs and Marty have to say. Although Bungie sort of bought themselves back before Halo 3, so we did three ODST and Reach as the developers Bungie, which were now independent again for Microsoft, the publisher. Anyway, that's more detail than you need. Well, but good detail, though. At, during that you know, 10, 15-year period, I was in-house. Mike, on the other hand, was still... O'Donnell Salvatore, that company never stopped in Chicago, and he was essentially, I was hiring Mike during that period as a contractor. Ooh. See, he's seen both sides of things. So I know what it's like to be a contractor, I know what it's like to be in-house composer, and I know what it's like to be the person in, as audio director who's hiring outside composers. This is important for later. It has to do with the business and creative as they talk about in this interview. Uh, Marty begins to talk about the creative side has this drive and desire and goal of wanting to produce. The business side has this, you know, the suits, the dollar signs, and you have to put these two contrasting personalities together. And like I said, they actually go into that a little more later into the interview, but that is a core aspect that we need to remember that you have these two conflicting personality types trying to live together. They're married and they're trying to get along and they just don't. And that begins to pose a problem. Um, Mick, I believe, has always been a contractor. So the majority of the way music is done for most titles Listen to this. is there is the in-house team. And it seems like lately, the last five, six, maybe even 10 years, what most games do is they have producers and audio leads and audio directors and then when it comes to music they'll hire an outside talent or out that's that's what we saw with it and you know chad was working on the inside working on the music from it but they brought in a contractor for the music now my personal opinion the business side remember you got to think about uh, you know, Marty Stratton's the business side, Mick is the creative side. So you have to consider, okay, why would they want to bring in a contractor? A lot of times when a company brings in a contractor, what they'll do this for is to save money. They may be able to pay them at a lower rate. They may be able to pay them hourly instead of salary. They don't have to worry about benefits, you know, healthcare, retirement, like 401k, 
you know, Roth IRA, whatever that you have, it's a cost cutting measurement because you get to pay this person by contract or by hour. It just really depends on the situation, obviously. But what we found here is that maybe Mick was contracted. It could be a money saving thing. I think really that's a core part of it. Outside contractor. Sometimes two. Sometimes they'll hire two different Andrew people. Andrew and David from um, the tag. And those people are usually outside contracts. They have, they're not part of the team. They're not inside. That's they big. Essentially, you know, have meetings and are instructed and maybe they have builds or maybe they have art, uh, concept art, and they do stuff based on those instructions. Now, the important thing to look at here, when he says their contract, they're apart, they're outside, they are not in often in the building with the others. So that sense of camaraderie, that's not there. You know, everything is separate. So if you were in the room with someone working with them, you'd have a more intimate relationship than if you were across the world. Literally, they were across the world. Mick is in Australia. Its software is located in Richardson, Texas. That is a huge time zone. So morning in Australia is evening here in the USA. So that disconnect is there. The inconvenience of meeting times. I mean, if you think about working with someone such a distance away, they're less of friends and more of business partners, if you, if you catch what I mean there. They write and produce music, throw it over the wall, and see what sticks. They'll see what the, the client accepts, what the client rejects. And I, to me, I feel like it's, it's not an ideal situation, and it leads to some of the problems uh, that we're seeing today with uh, a few of the composers who are more public about some of the... Um, conflicts and controversy that's going on so that that's important to note how public this went and marty will talk about this here in a second it's interesting how he thinks about this whole situation because you'll see it's really to me it's super unfortunate but of course who am i to talk i was an in-house guy for so long and i still ended up with a huge pile of conflicts and controversies it's and everywhere i've been through many uh iterations of legal problems including arbitration and lawsuits and everything else so i've learned i have become an expert in other areas that i never thought i'd be an expert in that's important because this means that he could possibly be a help to mick if mick has only seen the contract side of things and then marty has seen everything you can consider how the advice he could give, the resources he would have, maybe a whole lot more than what Mick has been able to amass over his career, despite how awesome it has been. So by trial long, and error, by yeah, yes, trial by, by trial fire, and error, and by thing. not necessarily something I I'm, I would recommend, by the way, to anybody. If you can well, avoid legal entanglements, uh, if you can avoid a lawsuit, you should avoid it at all costs. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and as Gibbs is agreeing here, they, they're just throwing music across the wall, seeing what sticks. That is not really a great way to approach art because that you put your soul into art. That's not putting your soul. That's making production pieces go. And so I gotta, I'm going to just say my opinion right now about the Mick Gordon situation. Unbelievably talented. Just amazing guy, composer, talent, just up off the wall. Um. What's he going to say? Something happened a couple of years ago. And when I saw that he basically, when somebody said, hey, this soundtrack that we got doesn't sound very good. And we're looking at the waveforms and there's pops and clicks and bad edits. So I need to pause this real quick for a second, because when that happened a couple of years ago, this was not just a thing like deep experienced masterful audio engineers or someone like Marty would see. When this happened, it blew up on Twitter, on social media. People recognized just by loading in the files, looking at the waveforms, that something was wrong here. This did not take an expert to see. Think about that. And Mick just responded by saying, of course he would say this. Like, how could, as a composer, how could you avoid it? You say, I didn't do that. <laughs> Somebody else did that. My name's on it, but what you're complaining about wasn't something I got to do. And that's all he said. He basically just said, I wasn't the one, I, I wasn't allowed to be the one actually finishing that soundtrack. And so he said that out loud. That's, that's going to be a problem. Uh, it's a little bit of foreshadowing here. Uh, he defended himself as you would with your art. Like, you, you would want to defend yourself. But was that necessarily the right thing to do? Is Marty is saying this? As what seems to be on Mick's side, is he saying Mick messed up or maybe not? Bizarre. Which, by the way, reminds me of something that happened 10 years ago. 
personal when experience. When we showed Destiny to the world for the first time, and up to that point, anything Bungie had ever done, every trailer, everything we ever did, was a Bungie product. Bungie made it. We wrote it. We sound designed it. We artistically created it, and there was music that was that I, you know that, that we did. Okay, think about that. At that moment, at a presentation of Destiny, there was an official gameplay trailer, and everybody thought it was done by Bungie. And I had already been fighting about this behind the scenes. And I remember saying, if anybody asks me if they can have the music to this, I'm going to have to tell them I didn't do the music. This was not done by Bungie. As a matter of fact, the music was library music that was used in Thor. Jeebs, maybe it was your music. No, 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 no. I would have remembered that. <laughs> oh, None of my okay. music has been heard around the world many times, but never made it into the gaming world. So sorry, man, not me. Yeah, but it was... So, so you're seeing here now that this situation that Mick went through, Marty did as well. Marty was axed from Bungie almost a decade ago now. So all these similarities, all these things that Mick is experiencing, maybe that's why Marty said, hey, let me reach out to you. I've been there. I've been in your shoes. I've been where you are, man. It was music that was just it was already being heard in sure. a Thor trailer and now it was being part of this Destiny trailer. I was I was incensed that that was happening and probably against my better judgment somebody asked me, "Can we have a copy of that music?" and I said, "Oh, uh, I'm glad you like the thing, but this was not produced by Bungie, it was produced by Activision." And that began the slow slide into me eventually being fired because I, I did I said something publicly that you just don't say. Mix as as we get in this next section, Mick did the same thing that Marty did. They said something that publicly business wise in the suit business world, not the creative artist world, musician in the suit business world, you don't say that. That's kind of throwing shade. That's kind of saying, you know, we, you know, I didn't make that. I'm working with these people as a contractor, but me, no, no, that's not my stuff. Definitely didn't do that. So you can see that puts it back on them on the back foot to say, okay, if our composer that we're contracting is saying these types of public statements that reflect badly on our company, truth may they be as they are, what are we going to do about that? And as Marty said, it's basically... Marty O'Donnell's story is Mick Gordon's rewound because everything that we've seen in, Mar in Mick Gordon's thing, these parallels that are drawn completely are coming from Marty, except the difference is, the core difference here, is that Marty saw this from the inside as an in-house employee as well as having contractor experience. Like, whenever they made this announcement that Marty was going to come and talk to him, I did not realize that all these parallels would be drawn. And that's funny you should say that, too, because I want to jump right into that aspect of it, the yep. public thing. Now, yep. the world of we are uh, we are live always on the Internet. You know, I have a saying, you know, once you post forever toast and, exactly. um, and <laughs> yeah. you know, and that has many iterations, as we all know. Um, but one of the things that you said earlier was the uh, fact that it went public, which is something we wouldn't have heard of 25 right years ago because there was no such thing as going public unless, you know, right. you had a little indie rag you were able to get an article in that only a few people exactly. would read. But right. now pulling in the drama of going public, once again, I don't know anything about the relationship between the gentleman that posted something on Reddit a couple years ago and Ooh, then uh, yeah. I will say one thing about... That's um, a guy named Marty Stratton who is the studio head. He is head of id Studios. And an important thing to remember is that Marty, as they're going to say, is not some dev. He is the head. So what he says absolutely has ramifications for id Software, Bethesda, Zenimax, Microsoft, all the way up the ladder. I mean, we're talking like four layers of things here and everyone below him as well. So okay. it, he was not just sort of one of the devs who just happened to take offense at what Mar what uh, Mick said, he he did a full blown public uh, uh, and and but to me that's just a so public unheard response of. in it's, a way that I thought was uh, was unusually um, mean spirited. Frankly, uh, maybe he felt like he was protecting his team. I don't know what, but he really went after Mick for saying the truth, which was I didn't produce that. If you. And you have to look at, he said, listen to, think about what Marty said, mean-spirited way. Now, when this letter first came out two years ago, the community rallied around id Software. They said, Mick, you know, you're meet, late to meet your deadlines. You're not producing on time. You're lazy, man. What are you doing? And there was a select few people that said, you know what? Hey, this letter, something's not exactly right about it. I can't put, quite put my finger on it, but I know that something is amiss here. And we come to find out two years later that 
things were not what they originally seemed. And that's why it's important as a community, and this is not everyone that does this. This is a generalized statement that is not applicable to everyone, to not lash out when we first see information to wait for the full story. There's there's three sides to every story, right? Yours, mine, and the truth. So it's important to remember that Marty came at this letter. Everything was carefully constructed. There's no doubt this was ran by a lawyer or two or seven because everything that he said would go on public record as Marty Stratton's words, its softwares, Bethesda, Zenimax, is Microsoft. So you can see how, how important this is to get it right and to what he's saying, make sure that it is covered and taken care of. If you don't like it, don't talk to me. Somebody else did it. Uh, you know, maybe Mick could have said those things publicly in a different way, but I from what I now have read in Mick's response, Mick was spending a lot of time behind the scenes trying to rectify a whole bunch of stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah, the, the we didn't work together or, or doubt we'll work together again. That was a whole big thing. There was Mick trying to offer to do the OST again. There, there was a lot that went on that we didn't know about in those two years and even the years before Eternal came out that just really put Mick in a hard spot, boxed in. And I've gone over a bunch of this stuff the details behind that in my original half hour analysis video if you've not seen it but let's continue but this public back like, and forth thing though this is the thing yeah, that to me it brings a different kind of energy because as you all know the world that we're in right now you have these you know uh, keyboard anarchists or whatever that were threatening actually threatening both sides yep. you know Death in threats. twitter or tiktok or whatever on the internet the social the internet. media sites you know yes. and it is it, it, it it's almost like a, tr a social trial before truth and just for me on the outside um you know that 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 guy martin did you say his name was martin uh, uh it's, it's actually marty it's marty, marty. Stra uh, uh, sta uh, straighten I think yeah so he comes out happened. first and gives mick to people's elbow um C can we just say how ironic it is that uh they're both named marty and again one and they're completely different side of things all right let's continue um, kind of like it yeah. felt like it was a preemptive thing like yeah. you said maybe to get out ahead of something that was about to boil over aggressively and then, at that. And then uh mick spends a couple of years trying to rectify it and then he re and releases this thing that just mile long and uh, you know that's and, and it, for me what what where i feel personally like oh shit, i know this i know this i know this is when you do get these um, what, what did you call it again? Crunch time? Crush time? Crunch, yep. These yeah. Crunch so what are you saying there? 15,000 words over an hour read time. I did them. I didn't count the words one by one. What he is saying is that Mick's story is not alone. What about the rest of the game dev industry? Could this have further ramifications and in, in instances here? Let's, let's Crunch, keep going. Uh, elements of like we're at the end. Now we need not only this. Oh, by the way, we need the export of all the stems. Oh, by the way, we need a reduced mix. Oh, by the way, we need all these things. Stack and I up. think everybody on the creative levels, you could be a colorist, uh, uh, you know, craft food service. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> when it comes yeah. towards the very <laughs> end, everybody yeah. goes under that. But the visceral heaviness of that battle unfolding on social media to me is like like i got to step back and go paddle out or go you know get in the water and just surf or something because it's just it's hard to hear the hardship yes. being yes. played out on public and then you have the super elitists like we have gaming elitists in my case i've 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 been, uh, uh, you know, targeted a few times uh, by like the hardcore heavy metal elitists on my other channel because let's say I put in, I don't know, a band that's not as, you know, they kind of, they've been nice to me, but it's just, it's a unique world out there to say something and you go, wow, you, so I don't like Dude, oranges. So you don't like oranges. So, so that's something to cut in real quick he's talking about right there is like now that we're on social media, things are different than they were years ago. 25 years ago not oranges heavy. you must you must not you must really hate bananas and i'm like oh, yeah no. rush is not heavy metal do you not know anything <laughs> you've been there you've seen it that's what i no, guess I sometimes. Have, i'm just assuming i'm yes. assuming that you like but okay, it's it's ahead. absolutely um it's heartbreaking to me it's heartbreaking yeah. to see mick going through what he's going through it's revealing at, at least i could say what it is it's revealing at what the emt level of a creative you know might and that's also based on personality. The one thing I, I yes. hope doesn't happen with this back and forth is it doesn't saddle the video game industry at large with, oh, this is how you treat your people to the public's view. And if we do that, that nobody wins in that situation if it gets to the point to where, oh, this is how video games treat their people. This is how contractors are treated. Think about that. That there yes. are gaming companies out there or 
or indie companies and stuff that treat everybody fairly and, and are very considerate so, to the creative process. And to me, that's like going, oh shit, I think this might be more damage control or crisis management control that the industry might have to kind of throw their hat in and say, now wait a second, <laughs> we're yeah. not Hall. This is not how we treat our composers, or, you know, but right. there is. So, let me just, uh, I will announce. I'm this sorry, the coffee just kicked show. in. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I'm at an age and also at a financial place where. I've got to cut him off because if he's at the age in a financial place where what this, he can stand out. He can make these statements for this reason. Check this out. Um, I am basically semi-retired from the game industry. I don't need to do games. I don't need to have this work in my life anymore. Um, I'm not saying it's a never thing. I'm not saying I'll never go back to it, but I don't need to. So I don't need to work in this industry. I still care a lot about this industry and I um, have some ideas about how to try to work with everybody to make it a more fair place. Uh, and I think you are right that the public, if the public gets the idea that working in the game industry is is bad and unfair, that, that is going to be really uh, uh, an unfortunate consequence of all of some of these things. And you know, like he said, he doesn't have to work here anymore, but he wants to help and be able to extend his experience over all these years that he has been where Mick is. They both have the letter M in their name. They've both been through the same situations. He wants to do right and help Mick out. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Check out my full breakdown of Mick's whole situation here. And I put gives in the description here. So go check out the rest of this interview. Two hours long. If you like more Marty O'Donnell, you got to go check it out there. I am Austin. Subscribe for more. Thank you to Gibbs. Thank you for watching. Have a good one.